What can be better than driving around on a summer's day than in a soft top car? And if you followed these Morgans, you'd have come to Nutley Windmill. And here at Nutley Windmill, we're going to celebrate National Mills Weekend 2023. Hi and welcome to National Mills Weekend 2023 as mills up and down the country open their doors once more to visitors after the long winter months. We celebrate both wind and water power in a packed programme. Coming up, we find out a little bit about the dying art of the traditional stone dresser. I don't know whether it's called enjoyable or not. <laughs> it's hard work. We explore windmill land on the Fylde coast. Marsh Mill really is a fascinating and interesting part of Thornton and Wyer's history and without doubt should be treasured and appreciated. We're down in Kent with Luke Bonwick at Mepham. My role is the conservation officer at Kent County Council and the conservation officer role is responsible for the eight windmills in the County Council's care, including this one at Mepham and Tim Whiting, the millwright, at Cranbrook. Cranbrook or Union Mill? Oh, I think it's Cranbrook to us because we have to quite a drive to get here. So uh, Union Mill to the locals, I would say. And we take a look at Crawley's milling heritage. My field is part of Crawley, and when the um, guys set up the restoration of my field mill in the 70s, Crawley Museum didn't exist. But first, a word with the SPAB mill section chair, Mildred Cookson. Well, welcome everybody from the Mills section and others as well um, to join National Mills Weekend this year on, in May. Um, we're going to have um, a theme this year, which is um, rather at the forefront at the moment of all mill people's minds, mill writing. So the theme this year is mill writing or mill rights past and present. And uh, like we say, it's getting a bit worrying our mill rights situation. Not only have we lost some mill rights in the last few years, but also the ones that are remaining are getting older and probably going to be retiring soon. So we need new new blood to take their places. And not easy. It takes several years to learn all the different aspects of mill writing, unless they just concentrate on one particular topic, say windmills, water mills, things like that. But uh, we've got some extremely good <clears throat> volunteer mill rights, which across the country and they're just amazing what they're doing and some of them are taking on jobs that the millwrights would do themselves so that is even better but we still need <clears throat> more people to come and do some apprenticeships as it were and we need some backing from the government or somewhere to help us we've only got the SPAB fellowship at the moment working for us and that's a very short period only part of a year's training for them so it just gives them a taster and hopefully that will encourage them to carry on. So we've had three now, or we've got, we're in the third one this year. So all being well, fingers crossed. Um, we've got some new mill rights climbing the ladder, as it were. We've got lots of mills open this year, and our website has got them up now, showing where the mills are. And uh, the SPAB's flagship windmill at Kibworth Harcourt is having its official opening on Sunday. Um, that's by invitation only, unfortunately. The site is very restricted, and so we've had to uh, make it invitation only. But it's open on the Saturday, May the 13th, so you can book that uh, via the website as well if you wish to visit. OK, well, I hope you all have a very good National Mills weekend. Local mills such as Nutley transformed grain into flour for the local population. But regardless of whether it was wind or water-powered mill, they done the same job and they used the same technology, that is, stone. 
It could be a millstone grit from the Peak District, or it could be the fabled French burr from the Marne Valley just outside Paris. Regardless of which stone was used, the principle was just the same as I'll demonstrate with my handy bagel. The stone came in two halves. The bottom half was set into the floor of the mill and didn't move. The top half was called the runner stone and that is what was rotated at between 100 and 120 revolutions a minute, grinding the grain into flour. The grain would be put into the eye of the stone, the middle, and encouraged out along furrows where it would be cut and chopped and as it reached the edge of the stone gradually file down into a fine flour. However, over time these furrows would become dull and the quality of the grain would suffer and the flour produced would be a coarser grind. So these furrows needed to be resharpened and colloquially that term is called dressing. So either the miller or maybe an itinerant stone dresser would spend two to three days redressing the stones. And I was lucky enough to spend some time last year at Hearn Mill in Kent with Charles and David Howell as they redressed their stones. My name's uh, Charles Howell, Offley Mill. Well, I'm probably, I think I'm the, either the fifth or sixth generation of millers, and we've been doing it all our lives. Helping my father when, back in the 60s, I suppose, it first started. He used to go around uh, all the local mills back in the 1920s and 30s, and he was, uh, he'd walk miles to go and dress a pair in all stones. We can usually do a pair uh, in a day. You can do one millstone with one tip, and the other one with the other tip, so one chisel will do the lot. Now in the olden days, uh, when, when my uncle, was, my father and my uncle were doing it, you were talking about 30 chisels to uh, just a pair of millstones. They were all hard and steel and uh, that's where you get the uh, uh, showing your metal from because they used to fly up and the metal used to dig in the back of their hands. Whereas with tungsten ones, you don't get any of that now. I've been doing it now about 20 years. Um, started off just running around bringing the equipment with me dad and my great uncle George uh, and he would teach me a bit each time. It's very rewarding, um, you feel it also feel as though you're doing what your ancestors did years ago. The stone has to talk to you sort of thing I think is the way, best way of describing it, um, that's, that's how I found it over the years. We still use the traditional anvil. Um, I feel it's the best way for best way. I don't think there's anything really replaces it. Right, this is called the staff, the wooden staff, and basically it's a level for the stone. The old-fashioned way is the way we do it now. Is you get the staff, you put ch a coloured chalk on it, and you put the staff over the stone like that, and then you run it round whatever momentum you want to around the stone. And then if you have a look now. It'll show you that the green chalk has marked the edge of the stone, but it hasn't marked it here. So that's a good sign for us. That means we don't have to really play with this anymore. I don't know whether you'd call it enjoyable or not. <laughs> it's hard work, but uh, uh, yeah, I suppose it's all right, yeah. Hi, Robert. Hello, Martin. Thanks very much for your time. Can you explain to me why we're standing here amongst two sails? Amongst our sails, yes. Well, back in on the 9th of November 2022, uh, one of the stocks broke and the sail gently fell down. Oh uh, no, was anybody hurt? No, it was slightly embarrassing. We had two ladies who had just come to see the mill. We had the sails turning and the, mill, the wind died down and the lady said to me, should you be making uh, that sound and we just looked up and the top sail just swayed a bit and fell down and came crashing down and made a hole in the side of the mill so uh, yes oh. now we've got to rebuild it all yes was there much damage to the mill no it's only made a small hole in the weatherboarding which we patched, temporarily patched up with a bit of 
uh, roofing felt. We're quite lucky really because inside there are two timbers that we, we think are dated around about 1700s and it managed to go the, uh, the end of the uh, sweep went right through between the middle of those. Do you know what caused um, the accident? Essentially it was uh, decay. But in the stock? Also, on, in the stock, yes. There was, uh, well, there was a, there's a, a, a knot yeah. and it was one of these knots that you can get where the bark, as the tree goes round the along it, it can leave the bark inside. Normally the bark just moves off out of the way. This one it stayed in, so there was a, a ring of bark and there was one of these splits that also arrived at exactly the same point and it was just, it was just bad luck that everything arrived at that one point and it just essentially rotted. So are you able to repair the mill? Yes, we. We've got the new stocks over there, all nicely shaped and everything. And uh, then on, we're planning on the 21st of uh, June to hire a crane to actually fit the two stocks. And then at some time after that, we'll be fitting the sweeps back on. And I believe you've got a little bit of good news. Can you share that with us? Yes, well, we, to help us raise money to do this work, we launched a crowdfunder campaign asking for 10,000 pounds. And it was uh, one of these funds that it's either all or nothing. If we'd only got 9,999, we'd have got nothing. Uh, but as of this afternoon, we are at uh, £10,179. Oh, wow. It's, it's actually quite an expensive thing to do for a small uh, volunteer organisation. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's quite an undertaking, really. But, uh, but if you've got a 400-year-old mill, you have to do these things. It's a grade two star listed. Congratulations on your um, fundraising and you, uh, fingers yes. crossed that everything goes well on the uh, 21st of June. Thank you, yes. I, I really must say thank you to everybody who actually uh, pledged for this Crown Funder thing because it's much appreciated. There is a land not far away where sails turn and transform grain into flour. With over 50 mills at its peak, the farmed area in Lancashire was known as Windmill Land and Marsh Mill in Thornton is one of the few remaining examples and this one is special because it's the only one still with its original machinery. Hello, I'm here today to show you one of the much loved treasures of the North West, the Marsh Mill Windmill here in Thornton. The Marsh Mill is a Grade 2 star listed heritage building as designated by Historic England. Built in 1794 at the behest of bold Fleetwood Hesketh, who had the local marsh drained creating more agricultural land for producing crops, the very reason he needed his mill. Now, the main crops produced in this area were oat, barley and wheat, but very often they came in damp from the fields. So in that case, they had to be brought inside and dried off in this building here, the drying kiln. We're going to take a look inside shortly, but before we do, I want to draw your attention to this millstone. It's a very special millstone indeed. This is a French burr. It is made from a very hard stone called metacortside, which came from a quarry in the Paris Basin. The pieces you see here arrived on sailing ships that docked in Liverpool, where they were assembled into this millstone. This stone has travelled a great distance for a reason. It's all down to the quality and texture of the fine white flour that this very special stone creates. Now we're on the inside, you can see this brick funnel. Now there's nothing behind this wall, it's completely empty. And that's to allow the heat generated from a peat fire to rise up and dry the crop on the floor above. The heat would rise up and dry the crop that was spread over a tile floor. The tiles are thick and hardy so they could hold the heat. And they have tiny holes through them to let the heat pass through and circulate. The miller would turn the crop until it was dry. When that was done it would go into chutes to be hoisted to the top of the mill where it begins its journey to become flour. Up 
here is the cap of Marsh Mill at the very top of this 70 foot tall structure. The cap turns as the wind shifts and inside the cap are these massive wheels which takes the power from the sails and transmits it downwards and that's what makes everything work. So this wooden shaft is taking the power from those massive wheels above us in the cap and then that power is transferred down to the third floor where the machinery will grind the corn. Well it's actually going into this giant spur wheel with giant teeth that transfer power to the other smaller wheels which in turn rotate the millstones. These millstones are the heaviest pieces of equipment in the mill. Each one, when new, weighed in excess of a ton. And the grain would fall down into these hoppers, into the shoe, and then be fed into the centre of the stones where the grinding would take place. And the resulting flour was swept away to go downstairs to be processed. Now we've come down a floor to catch up with the flour after it comes out of the millstones. It comes down these chutes here and into the great sifter, where it is sifted before it goes downstairs to be sacked and weighed. Now we've come down another floor and the flour is coming to the end of its process, coming down these chutes here to be sacked and weighed before continuing on to its final destination. Marsh Mill really is a fascinating and interesting part of Thornton and Wyatt's history and without doubt should be treasured and appreciated. Mepham is a small English village, complete with cricket green, two pubs and of course a windmill. I've come down to Mepham in the Garden of England, where Kent County Council is continuing its stewardship of the mills in its care by restoring Mepham's sails and cap. My role is the Conservation Officer at Kent County Council and the Conservation Officer role is responsible for the eight windmills in the County Council's care, including this one at Mepham. So what's going on with Mepham Mill? So uh, we are in the process of returning Mepham Mill to working order. And we're at currently stage three, which is the removal of the sweeps and the cap. And we need to do that because the cap is seized on top of the tower. So we need to get it off and get it back to the workshops where we can see what's wrong with it and address some of the structural and mechanical issues. So it means that really the sails couldn't be turned into the wind for a long time. That's right, so the cap hasn't really turned for about 15 years, I think, and that means that the sails were only facing in one direction for a long time. So uh, we'll need to, uh, in addition to making new sails, re-engineer the fantail um, mechanism, which steers the cap automatically so it faces the wind. Do you think that's a problem solely with MEPAM, or, or is it just one of these things that happened? That's a good question. I think a lot of the mills have problems with their fan tails. That seems to be the Achilles heel with them. Um, the fan tail and the kerb. I don't know whether you're aware that the kerb is a circle which sits on top of the hexagonal or octagonal smock tower. And if that kerb, that circle goes egg shaped or if it becomes out of level, then that means that the cap will seize up and it won't turn. Um, Mepham is an interesting one. Um, it had steel stocks on it, which have been on for a very long time, so uh, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, a lot of the work that was done on it is, is different to how we're used to, things being wedged up strangely. Um, it, it's always very hard to, to start on a fresh project and really focus on working out what has been done prior um, and um, to then base your, your work off it. Uh, it has to be quite a flexible plan. Um, you need to be uh, aware that you're going to have to change things at short notice. Um, but hopefully, hopefully this will now, I think we're there now, hopefully. There's a lot of 
a lot of issues up there to the point where it's a, uh, a big question mark on how we're lifting it off. Why is that? Um, because the areas where we'd normally lift the cap off are the areas where the timbers are broken. What's the plan with Mepham Mill? How do you see its future? Well, I like to think that Mepham Mill, because of its fantastic location uh, in the centre of the village, I really think it could come back to being a functional uh, piece of machinery, a, a functional building. Um, who knows, we might even be able to make, make flour at the end for human consumption or simply just for demonstration. But there's no reason why we couldn't do that with the power of the wind um, and the support of local people uh, to enable the public to see it working. How's the local village of Mepham been involved with the mill? Well, they've been involved over quite a few years, probably since 1969, when the mill um, and the land in front of it passed into a lease to the Mepham Windmill Trust and that's connected to the Mepham Parish Council. So there's always been a real volunteer backing uh, behind the, the fortunes of the mill. Come on, Keep going, keep going. Right, you flew off there, mate. Come on, there you go. went very well, a very professional team, um, I knew it was going to be A-OK -okay, and it went very smoothly, it took quite a long time to get it to balance and to, to rig it and then uh, it didn't put up too much resistance when it was finally lifted off and then dropped down onto the back of the flatbed lorry. Highfield Watermill, near Crawley, is thought to be the last remaining working mill still using its original pond in West Sussex. It's a very large mill here. Uh, it's got powerful wheels plenty of wood, water to supply the, the wheel, so yes, it was an important mill here. Now this wheel was the second widest one that Sussex ever had. It's 11 foot 6 wide, it's 11 foot 6 diameter, so it was a very powerful overshot water wheel. This wheel here, is, is this the original one? or is this Yes, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it is, yes, it's the original wheel as far as we're concerned. There's, it's thought there was an iron forge here back in the Middle Ages. It wasn't until after the Civil War in the 1683 period that uh, a corn mill was re-established here and uh, with the lake right behind us, um, it was a perfect to turn it into a, the water mill. So when did this mill stop working? Around about 1920 to 25 period, there's competition for the miller and uh, there was less money for him to be made. Um, other methods of production of flour was being introduced and um, he couldn't keep up with it. And then what happened to this building? It was derelict until 1974 and then uh, a young boy was passing and he ran home to his dad and said, um, we have, I found a, an old derelict mill. And the father was very interested. He came and looked. And then he started up um, uh, with uh, his friends. They started up to repair the building. Why did Crawley get involved with Ifield? Ifield is part of Crawley. And when the um, guys set up the restoration of Ifield Mill in the 70s, Crawley Museum didn't exist. Um, and it wasn't until the 1990s 
that the museum started to become a theme, partly to help uh, restore the mill and help maintain the mill, but also to present that history of Crawley. So we think it's essential to keep this mill preserved for the history of Ifield and Crawley. So in the overshot water wheel, uh, we reckon, we've done a number of calculations, we think that possibly at its peak there would have been 30 horsepower here, but an overshot water wheel being the most efficient type of wheel. This mill I think could, could have, with its double width, driven three pairs of millstones. Is it important to get the local people involved with the mill? Absolutely. It's the local people that are uh, that we're relying on for volunteers, uh, for those regular visitors. We might get um, people coming in, but they'd only come once, maybe twice in their lifetimes. But local people can come regularly. And what is your involvement as well, a volunteer? I'm a volunteer here. I only come on Sundays to keep an eye on the place, uh, to order repair jobs. Is it more of an interest? Is, is it sort of a, a satisfaction to put in something back to society? Exactly. Um, as I say, when you're retired you want something to do. And uh, because history is my love, uh, old buildings, ancient buildings, um, it's exactly what I wanted to do with the team. Because it takes a team to repair buildings like this. We would like to open the mill more regularly. Currently we only do five or six open days a year but if we could expand that, um, increase its profile. A lot of people that we speak to locally say, oh, I've lived here for 35 years and I've never been in. So encouraging people to come in and to come from further afield because we are a unique building, uh, we can offer something that people might not be able to see where they're from. Such a wonderful building. It's a brilliant building. It's beautiful to work with. Cranbrook is a small Kentish town and at the heart of the town lies Union Windmill. Cranbrook Union Mill was built in 1814 and uh, there was lots of demand for milling. Britain was at war with France and the lady who lives um, just on the entrance as you come in, Mary Dobell, she um, commissioned the mill. Uh, so at first business boomed, but unfortunately, if you know your history, in 1815 there was the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon got um, whipped on his tail, so to speak. The war ended and all the soldiers went home. Demand for flour and all that uh, fell, seriously and um, Mary hung on for a few years but basically eventually declared bankrupt. She owed money to some local businessmen and um, couldn't pay them back so they took over the mill and it became a mill belonging to a union of her creditors which is where the union mill came in. I've been involved on and off a little bit since uh, 2015 when uh, the sales originally um, had uh, shown signs of uh, deterioration. What have been the challenges um, with this project? The access to this site has been has been very very tricky very very tricky. Uh, obviously all of the components we've built have come down from Suffolk so we've had to have low loaders um, carrying everything down here. The main stocks that you can just about see there behind the sail frames um, had to come in and through where we stood here this morning. So everything had to be sneaked through at low level and then picked up by the crane. And as you can see, there's not much space here, so. And what keeps your passion with mill writing? I don't know, it's sort of in your blood. I think once you've started one, you're, you're looking at the next. It's just uh, like anyone else with an interest on the mills, we, we have an interest in putting them back to how they should be. So today it's finishing touches on the sails, so hopefully by the end of today all the wind boards will have been fitted. Uh, the wind boards 
Uh, they go up alongside the uh, whips on the, on the sweeps. Um, and essentially we can't put them on uh, when we lift them up because that's the crane strops go around the, the main timber, so they have to go on afterwards, otherwise they'd, they'd crush. People who did the sort of decorative work, painting, repair of the woodwork of the smock, um, a firm from Ashford called Reddick were employed. And we were very pleased with them. Their workers were very meticulous, um, were very considerate of other people, including our neighbours. Speaking of the local people, how does Cranbrook itself feel about the windmill? Well, they, most people love the windmill. Um, we opened the mill uh, between about Easter and the end of September. When the sales came back this time, our, our visitor numbers doubled. And then if the sales are turning around because we can, we're grinding, then they shoot up. People see it and obviously, hey, wow, well, let's go up there, so to speak. Is there anything that you could show me today? Yes, we've got uh, a few different components that we've made for the mill uh, that haven't gone on quite yet, so I'm more than happy to show you some of the castings we've made and some of the brackets. So Tim, can you tell me about what we've got here, please? So this is a selection of the parts required to leave the mill capable of turning to wind. So here we've got a pair of reduction uh, bevels that go up on the fly spindle and the downshaft and these two castings here um, are held in place with these very small wedges which just slide down those shims there and tap up nice and tight on the shaft and then holding the shaft down we've got bearing caps here that go on and they are held down with this is an original one uh, with a bracket here and this was made with a blacksmith's um, own thread and uh, it's been nearly impossible to match these nuts so we've had to produce uh, new brackets um, to match the old ones as you can see it's um, pretty much the same design but the thread pitch here this is a Whitworth thread we've used which is a fairly standard windmill thread up against the slightly coarser original one so this is essentially a kit to allow the wind, uh, the windmill to turn to wind. Brilliant. And you'll put them on today? These will be going on today or tomorrow. Hopefully the weather will carry on as nice as it is for us and we won't cook too much. And then uh, the wind, should, the windmill should hopefully be let free so it'll be uh, winding itself again. Well, we're just coming to the end of our day here at Nutley and before we go, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all our contributors for this year's film and to you for watching National Mills Weekend 2023 and we look forward to seeing you next year.